In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14, at the end of the verse, Jesus says this, and then the end will come. We live in a time when a great many people are talking about the problems around the world, the violence that they see on the nightly news, the natural disasters they hear, or images that are recorded on the news as well, now, the pandemic that we've been facing for months. And they start asking the question, are we living in the last days? And invariably, somebody actually takes a look at Matthew chapter 24 and says, look at what Jesus says in Matthew 24, so certainly we're living in the last days. I want to take a look at the context of Matthew chapter 24 and see if the way that a lot of people use this chapter, see if that way is really a valid way to use it in the first place. Here's the way that it begins. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you see all these things? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. In verse number 3, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? As far as they're concerned, in the Jewish mindset, would uh, the average Jewish mindset would be exactly the same. You're talking about the destruction of the temple of Jerusalem, where not one stone's left upon another. That's it. And the questions that, that they ask, uh, the way that, that Matthew records them, it's as if they expect all of those things actually to be happening simultaneously. So the initial question in Jesus' answers, we read through it, is Jesus answering just one question? Or is answering more than one question because they ask more than one question. Here the great began a reconstruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 20 BC. It was something that actually continued long after his death. In fact, by the time the, the disciples were asking, asking Jesus to see all the beauty around them and what's being built, it's still under construction. The construction of the temple building and the surrounding grounds do not finish until A.D. 64, over three decades after the crucifixion of Jesus has taken place. And when they hear Jesus say there's going to be a time when not one stone is left upon another and they see the, the construction is still ongoing, how's that possible? To the Jewish mind, that's the destruction of everything. Because anticipated in that is not just the destruction of the temple, but that sounds like a siege against the entire city. That's like the end of everything. Does Jesus answer one question? Or more than one question, since they ask more than one question. So how does he give an answer to when they will be noticing signs that lead up to the destruction of the temple and the destruction of Jerusalem. How does he answer that? Beginning in verse 4, he says this, Take heed that no one deceive you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. A lot of people will be deceived, but don't you be led astray. Verse number 6, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. So when I hear about wars and rumors of wars, Jesus says, don't be upset. Don't be troubled. When I hear about all these nations fighting against each other and the pestilence and earthquakes, it's the beginning of sorrows. They're asking about the destruction of the temple. These things don't point to it. What does? In verse 9 and verse 10, he talks about the persecution they're going to endure before the temple's destroyed. They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. Many false prophets will arise up and deceive many. Because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Endures to the end? Saved from what? They're asking when the temple would be destroyed. Jesus says you'll be persecuted before that happens. We have false prophets come in before that happens. Many will be deceived before that happens. And because of, because of all the lawlessness, the faith of many is going to be devastated. That love of God is going to grow cold. 
before that destruction takes place. But the person that endures to the end, the person that is not deceived, the person whose faith remains strong, the person whose heart does not grow cold, the person who is aware of what Jesus is telling them at this point in time, will be safe. Safe from what? From that destruction of Jerusalem. Because that's the content of his answer up to this point in time. And it continues. The verse 14 is verse 14 that people say, well, wait a minute. That doesn't sound like that's happened, so this has got to be future. Here's verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. I've heard people say, well, see, that, that can't be the destruction of Jerusalem because that hasn't happened yet. In Colossians chapter 1, when Paul is writing to the Christians in the city of Colossae, in verse 23, Paul says this. He encourages them to continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Was Paul right? Was the Apostle Paul wrong? Did the Apostle Paul say something that was true? Did the Apostle Paul say something that was false? If I make the statement that what Jesus is saying can't possibly happen before the destruction of the temple, but Paul said it did happen before the destruction of the temple, am I taking it out of context? If I conclude that it hasn't happened yet, and Paul said it has, am I right and Paul is wrong? Or is Paul right and I'm wrong? Or is Jesus wrong? The statement to the Christians in Colossae happens before that destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus makes a statement before that destruction happens. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end, the destruction of the temple, the siege of Jerusalem, will come. Now, I don't know that's still talking about that answer to that question. In verse number 15, Matthew records this, Jesus saying, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by prophet the Daniel standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Well, it's a statement of Daniel chapter 11. You find it also in Daniel chapter 12. What does it have a reference to in this particular situation? There's a parallel account in Luke to what Jesus says here. I want you to notice how it reads. It's a shorter account. It's more of a summary. Beginning in verse 8 of Luke chapter 21, Jesus says, Take heed that you do not be deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is drawn near, therefore do not go after them. When you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Jesus says in verse 10, Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes in various places, famines, pestilence. Sound familiar? What about that abomination of desolation? When you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place, Matthew records, then flee. Those in Judea flee to the mountains. Luke chapter 21, verse 20. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. See the parallel? What Jesus is saying in his answer to the question about the destruction of the temple starts in verse 4, goes beyond verse 15, into verse 16 and following of Matthew chapter 24. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back to get clothes. Woe to those who are pregnant, to those who are nursing babies in those days. What does Luke record? Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant. And those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon all this people. Parallel account. What Jesus is answering is their first question. 
the destruction of Jerusalem. Well, wars and, you know, before the destruction of Jerusalem. The pestilence, mm -hmm, before the destruction of Jerusalem. Nation against nation, before the destruction of Jerusalem. The abomination of desolation, armies encamped around Jerusalem. The Christians got out. Before Titus put that grip around the city of Jerusalem and began that nine-month siege, the Christians got out. There are historians that talk about them actually crossing the Jordan River to go on the east side of the Jordan and go get away from all the violence and the bloodshed. Historians record that over a million people died, Jews and Romans. The Jews fought very valiantly. A lot of Roman soldiers were killed, but the wrath of Rome soon came down on the inhabitants of the city. Josephus, the historian who is with the Roman army writing down the events of this siege against Jerusalem. So the streets run ankle deep in blood. He who endures to the end will be saved. You've got to know when to get out. And then somebody very much says, yeah, but wait a minute, wait a minute, because in Matthew 24, verse 29 and following, look at what Jesus says. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He'll send out his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. They'll gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. That sounds like the end of days. Look back at Isaiah for just a moment. Isaiah chapter 13. Listen to verse 10. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth. The moon will not cause its light to shine. End of the world? No. Context of Isaiah 13, verse 1. The burden against Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw. What happens? In Hebrew writings, apocalyptic language is something that has cataclysmic uh, um, repercussions. That kind of language is used to talk about the devastation that you find in these earthly kingdoms. This is against Babylon. Take a look at another one. And only one more for lack of time. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 32, verse 2. Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, well, what am I going to say to Pharaoh? Verse 7, I'll put out your light. I will cover the heavens and make its stars dark. I'll cover the sun with a cloud, and the moon shall not give her light. All the bright lights of the heavens I'll make dark over you and bring darkness upon your land, says the Lord God. How do I do that? Verse 11, for thus says the Lord God, the sword of the king of Babylon shall come upon you. Same kind of statement. Jesus is using that same kind of illustrative imagery that you find in the Old Testament that should be understood by every student of God's Word. He's talking about something as cataclysmic, beyond belief. But the subject is the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem. To take any of these verses all the way up through where we where we were in Matthew 24, from Jesus' answer beginning in verse 4, at least all the way down through verse 31, and make them apply to today, that does a disservice to Jesus. That's not what his answer involved. The disciples are asking, okay, not one stone is left upon another in this temple that's still being built? When is that going to happen? When you see those armies encompass Jerusalem, leave. When did that happen? When did that destruction take place? When was that temple totally destroyed? A.D. 70. Not 2020. I can't use Matthew 24 to talk about this part of Matthew 24 to talk about anything beyond the destruction of the temple. Now, the next time we're together, in verse 36 of Matthew 24, Jesus says, But of that day and hour, nobody knows. He gives signs leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, the end of the world. But of that day and hour, 
no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Make sure that we take a look at context every time we open God's Word. Interesting chapter. Please stay safe. We'll talk again soon.